Estuaries are places that are always getting slammed by different kinds of impacts. Freezes are a big impact in Florida, although in the northern United States, freezes are commonplace. Um, Renee, how do animals use the estuaries? Well, estuaries are used by a variety of animals for a number of reasons. One of them is for protected habitat. For example, female sharks often come into an estuary to breed and raise their young in the protected enclosures of the estuary where large predators that live offshore are normally found. Other animals like manatees use estuaries because they are protected and they're calm and they typically have shallow waters. At least here in Florida, the manatees will use the estuary for resting or for feeding, but also for raising their young as well. So in this case, estuaries are often considered the nursery of the sea. Um, uh, Renee, how do people enjoy estuaries? Well, Jake, there's a variety of ways that people can enjoy estuaries. Um, some of the more active types of, of enjoyment can come in the form of kayaking, sailing, and fishing. You can enjoy estuaries by discovery and exploring through the arts. You can do bird watching. You can do photography and enjoy art and music. There's any variety of ways that people can enjoy estuaries, but mostly they're great for recreation. Um, Ernie and Renee, we've learned all these great things about estuaries, but what can we do to help them? Oh, that's a free question for me. As a scientist, I cannot emphasize the importance of discovering new things about estuaries. We constantly have to grow our knowledge in order to take care of natural resources. So I encourage every student watching today to give thought to a career in science and especially in marine science. Uh, we'll be watching for you down here in Charlotte Harbor in the future. Um, another thing that we can do to help protect estuaries is by volunteering our time with organizations that work in estuaries. We can help with native plants. We can help um, do a lot of things to maintain the health of our estuaries. But we can also do things in our everyday life that have an effect on the health of our estuaries. For example, not littering and being a safe boater and um, also things that you can do in your own yard if you live near the coast um, can have an effect on the estuary. So you want to always take care that you don't um, use too many chemicals or fertilizers on your yard. Use things like that sparingly in because these items will end up in the estuary at some point in the future of the fresh water. We have some questions. We have some questions here from our live audience out on the internet, and we're going to have um, some of these questions read out loud now. Let's start with Jake um, from Plant City High School. How can I ask as the biodiversity of our estuary? Well, um, through science, we can assess biodiversity assess. in a variety of ways. Biodiversity means how many different kinds of plants and animals live in an area and by doing studies and monitoring we can understand who lives in our estuary and we can make determinations over whether those are healthy numbers and we can make um, judgments based on our findings scientifically. What do you think, Ernie? Uh, my advice would be to pick one group that you're really excited about. The biodiversity encompasses all of the life forms of the estuary but we learn that biodiversity by studying them a group at a time. So if you're really turned on by birds or shrimps or fishes, make that your hobby, make that your, your uh, special project. Um, this is from Mrs. Wilder's class uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. How does de the department affect the health of the estuaries? Development affect the health of the estuaries? Um, coastal development is ongoing and we will always see development in our area in such a beautiful place like Southwest Florida where many people would love to live year round. One of the things that development can do is um, reduce the amount of coastal habitat and also can have effects on the quality of the water in the area. There's other ways that developments can affect estuaries. Do you have any other ideas? Well, we put more people in contact with the water which is good because it makes everyone an advocate for conserving the water, but just our sheer numbers run the risk of wearing down our resources. New development today 
is seeking win-win solutions. And our big challenge in Florida for the future is undoing 100 years of unintentional but nevertheless historically damaging development. From Pedro Medendez High School from the Marine Science class, what are the differences between estuaries in Florida and other states? Well, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> Florida's in the subtropics, so we're surrounded by mangroves, and mangroves are, uh, you'll be learning about in the next session. Uh, they're, they are a, a big difference between uh, Florida's estuaries and other national estuaries. Our tides are not very large compared to other estuaries, and that shows up in our beaches, shorelines, and intertidal ecology. And we have some plants, uh, some animal species that are Caribbean in nature that make uh, fishing, diving, snorkeling, and collecting a, a fantastic experience. Some other ways that estuaries in Florida differ from those around the country are some of the very generic atmospheric conditions that we enjoy here in Florida. For example, water temperature is typically a lot higher in our estuaries in Florida than it is in an estuary in the Northeast. Also, our estuaries never freeze over, although they can become quite cold in the winter months but um, we do see a little less fluctuation in water and air temperature throughout the seasons here than you might in other estuaries. I think we have time for one more question. Um, from Satori School in Galveston, Texas, Ms. Cor um, Corley's upper school class, fourth and fifth grade. What is the biggest estuary in the United States and where is it located? Ah, the trick question. <laughs> the biggest enclosed estuary would be um, Chesapeake Bay on the Atlantic coast. However, the Mississippi River pushes a tremendous amount of fresh water all up and down the Louisiana and Texas coasts in the open water environments. So if you used salinity per se as a measure of the dilution of um, seawater by fresh water, the northern Tex uh, Gulf of Mexico coast is a huge estuary. It's a matter of definitions. Charlotte Harbor, depending on the definitions, is about 17th in the nation, and we're real proud of that. Renee, would you like to add anything? No, only that estuaries are found in a variety of different shapes and sizes, and it doesn't matter how large or how small the estuary is, they're all equally important. Good question. Well, I wanted to thank you all. We've got Renee Wilson from Mercury Bay, Ernie Estevez from Moat Marine Laboratory, and the school in the park in Sarasota, we've got Jake, Michael, and Xander. So thank you all very much. At the end of the hour, we're going to have time to answer a few more questions about estuaries, so keep sending them in, and they'll be back at the at about 55 minutes after the hour. Right now we're going to go to a video while we move to our second location.
tape you just saw sh showed some of the diversity of estuaries in southwest Florida and some of the impacts to those estuaries. Right now I'd like to introduce Carol Mahler with the uh, Peace River Center for Writers who will be telling us a story. This story is from Legend of the Seminoles by Betty Mae Jumper. When God first created the possum, she had beautiful, long, silky white hair on her tail, and she held it up and switched it all around, so much so that the other animals were very upset, and they said if any of them can teach her a lesson, they should. One day, Possum was walking through the forest, and she was swishing her tail, and that beautiful, long, silky hair was swaying in the breeze. She said, my tail is so beautiful. I wonder what I could do to make it more beautiful. Rabbit hopped up and said, Oh, Possum, if you take some of the Spanish moss out of the trees and wrap it around your tail and leave it overnight, when you take it off in the morning, your tail will be more beautiful. Possum was no dummy. She thought, if I leave that Spanish moss on my tail for one night and it will be more beautiful, if I leave it for a week, it will be terrific. And so she did. And after a week, when she unwrapped that Spanish moss from her tail, she had no hair left on her tail. And that is why to this day, the possum has no hair on her tail. Thank you, Carol. At the end of our this session on mangroves, we're going to go back to Carol for another story. At this time, I'd like to introduce our experts, Dr. Matt Finn with Huckleberry Fisheries. Hi there. And Dr. Bill Hammond with the Florida Gulf Coast University. Good morning. And we're really pleased to have the Curious Kids Club from WGCU with us today. We've got Amanda. Hi. We've got Will. Hello. We've got Albany. Hi. And Diavante. Hi. So who has the first question? Well, we were going to talk a little bit about what's so special about mangroves, you know, and we're in the middle of a mangrove forest here that's, that's pretty unusual. You know, it's a tropical forest that goes all through the Caribbean and around the world in the southern hemisphere and all the way to Asia and Australia. And, you know, what's so special about it is its ability, you know, we biologists look at how sunlight is taken in and made into food. So every one of these trees is, has, has leaves that are solar collectors, and each kind of solar collector has a little different way of making its living. And so Dr. Finn's going to take you through and show you how some of these different uh, mangrove types uh, look and how you can tell one from the other in the forest. Hi, I'm Captain Matt, and I'm a mangrove maniac. And we're going to show you some things about the mangroves, and we're going to tell you a little bit about the mangroves. And I'm hoping maybe just one of you is going to become a mangrove maniac too, okay? Now, in Florida, there's only three types of mangroves, red, black, and white. And now if we look over here a little bit, the trunk and roots of the red mangrove has a very reddish color, okay? And down the path, we see the black mangrove. And the black mangrove's trunk is very blackish. Blackish, way to go, little D. Now, right up here, there's a white mangrove, and the trunk and bark of the white mangrove is very whitish. Way to go, kids. Okay, you're on your way to becoming mangrove experts, and very soon a mangrove maniac. Now, a few more things that'll help you identify the mangrove trees. The red mangrove has these weird sort of fanciful roots that you see down here. It's almost like a Dr. Zeus type of tree. These are called prop roots, and they help to support the tree in this often mucky sediment. Okay, now with the red mangrove, we also have some very interesting thing to show you here with the types of leaves that are on it. It has these very shiny, glossy green leaves, and they're often in a whirl, very close together. And on this particular one, we can see some of the seeds. Now the mangroves, all of them, have one very special thing. This mother plant, the seeds actually germinate or start growing while they're still attached to the plant and that's pretty special. Okay, now let me show you one. What happens, this seed, as it grows older, okay, it starts to germinate, and what we're looking at now is a little baby plant that the mangrove is just about to drop off. And what happens, okay, now we're gonna do something funny here. It's up, pretend this is still on the tree, okay? Now when it's about ready to be born, this brand new mangrove tree, well, this one's a little stubborn, okay, now this is actually a baby mangrove tree. And what happens, it now falls off the tree and it's gonna drop into the water, float around, and maybe get stuck somewhere and become a whole new tree. Now let's go see. Little D, you wanna try to put that in the water for us? 
Okay, he's going to start up a brand new tree. Wait just a second. Okay, ready? Let her go. Okay, it's in there. Okay, now that will probably float upstream a little ways because the tide's coming in, and in no time it's going to become a new tree. Now, what we're going to do too is we're going to give each of you one of these little baby mangrove trees to take home. And at your home, you get to plant them in a little glass of water. Here you go, Albany. Well, Amanda, everybody gets their own little red mangrove tree. Now, you're going to plant that at your house. And in no time, you're going to see the leaves start to grow. And it'll become a little baby tree like this. And it'll just keep growing and growing. And before too long, it's going to make those fanciful roots we talked about. Okay. Red mangrove. Everyone knows that now. Okay. The next type of mangrove tree we're going to take a look at real quick is the black mangrove. Now, the black mangrove has a very... Blackish bark. Okay. Now, another thing a black mangrove way you can tell in the forest is it has these weird roots sticking straight up out of the ground, sort of like pencils. And that helps it breathe in the mud. Now, when we look at the leaves, the leaves are this nice green color. But what's weird about the black mangrove is the underside of the leaf is very whitish gray. Okay. Now, that whitish gray comes from tiny little hairs on the underside of the leaf. Another thing you'll often see, although we can't show it to you today, is salt crystals, often on the leaves. But we had a big rain last night, so it washed all the salt off, and that's, that's good for the tree. It helps it get rid of some salt. Okay, what's our last mangrove we haven't talked about yet? White, white mangroves. Okay, which has a trunk that is very whitish. White okay, now here's some leaves of the white mangrove. You can see they come up off opposite of each other, and they're sort of roundish with a dent in the top. And at the base of them, I don't know if you can see this, are two small glands. And they'll secrete some sugars and sometimes a little bit of salt, too. And maybe these this, this, uh, glands here that secrete the sugar attract ants. And now the ants might help the plant by keeping off insects that would otherwise eat it. Okay, I think you're well on your way to becoming a mangrove experts. And now we'll go back to Dr. Hammond. Questions? Oh, do we have any questions? That's a good one. How does the energy go through the um, the food chain? Yes. That's, a, that's a really super question. Remember we said that the sunlight provides all the energy? And then it has to come in the solar collectors. How many different kinds of solar collectors did you just look at? The three different mangrove trees. 8.8 .8 metric tons per hectare of that leaf stuff falls down into the, you know, into the creek here and into the bays. And, you know, as it falls, it provides the energy to go from the tree, the chemical energy that's been made by the tree, into the creek. And some, when we were walking around the mangroves, you saw some things eat the mangrove leaves right away. There's a lot of insects in here and other critters that'll feed on the leaves. Some of the crabs even feed on the leaves. But, you know, uh, Dr. Heald years ago got his doctoral degree measuring what went into a mullet and what came out, and what went into a crab and what came out, you know? And what he basically found was that the mangrove leaf, when it falls in the water, starts to gain in food value. Protozoa, you know, little one-celled animals and yeast and bacteria and fungi, all start growing in and on the leaf. And what the mullet were doing is when that pellet went through them, they digested all that stuff and out came the mangrove pellet again, the mangrove leaf, but now smaller with more surface area. And then a, a, a barnacle would suck that in and eat it and take off the stuff off of it and, and, and let the, the mangrove pellet back out again. And then a shrimp, you ever watch a shrimp in a bait bucket where their feet are going all the time and pushing stuff in their mouth? It would do the same thing. So that energy transfers itself through that food chain from one animal to the next, and then we eat that shrimp or we eat that fish, and we get the energy, and then we pass it on. So that's basically how it moves through that food chain. We're all eating sunlight. That green plants converts into chemical energy that then moves through the food chain that we, we get to eat. So another question. How does the pod that falls from the tree get planted? Because um, it said it just falls and now it's floating. How does it get stuck into the ground? Okay, Will, that was a, a great question. Can I borrow your propagule? We're going to call this a propagule because it's actually a little baby tree. It's no longer a seed. It's a tree ready to go. Okay, now what we had talked about is how it detaches from the seed. Can I pull your seed capsule off? Okay, the seed capsule, bloop, and we can see, I don't know if you can get close enough, we can see the little leaves already formed at the top of this propagule. Okay, so 
what happens is now this is going to drop into the water and once it's in the water it's going to bob along okay it's going upstream or it's going downstream bobbing that's why some people may also call this a mangrove bobber it's just it's just a little baby mangrove tree that hasn't found its home yet okay so it's going to bob along until something happens maybe it gets stuck in some mud okay and now she's kind of stuck there and in, in no time at all it starts growing roots using up some nutrients from the sediments and these leaves open up and now we've got the solar collectors and we begin a tree and then it's going to in, in no time at all it'll become a big tree that's a great question Here, here's your mangrove propagule oh you want the seed capsule too here you go why don't the mangroves grow up north albany that's a, that's another good one you are mentioned as a tropical tree so so what do you think the thing that keeps it from growing north would be if it's a tropical tree the frost. So in Florida, you know, we're one of the only places in, in North America that has mangroves. You know, Mexico has them too. But, you know, on, in Florida's coast, they go up the west coast of Florida, just above Tampa, almost to Newport Ritchie in that area. And they're, they get smaller and smaller because they get hit by frost year after year. And pretty soon they can't make a living anymore. So grasses, we call them salt marsh grasses, take their place we're in the cold weather areas. And on the east coast of Florida, they go up to about Jacksonville. You know, why would they go further north on the east coast of Florida than on the west coast? Because of the Gulf Stream? Yes, good, Matt. I, I, well, the Gulf Stream, you know, warms up the climate along the coast area, and that, that'll do it for us, right? And that's, that's how come they, uh, they're Florida trees. They're the whole Caribbean. Those seeds go, they may be, some of them, landing in Costa Rica or, or, in, or, or in the Caribbean islands. So good question. Why is the water around the mangroves so dark? Okay, that, that's a great question there, um, Amanda. When you look at the water, you might think, well, it's all dirty, but it's really not dirty. Okay, first, we're in this mangrove forest, and, and much of the sun's energy has been cut off by the trees. But if you notice, the water itself has a very brownish color. What drink does that maybe remind you of? Anybody? Iced tea, that's right, and that's basically what we have here. We've created sort of a mangrove tea, and how that happens is all those leaves that Dr. Hammond was talking about falling into the water and starting to rot, they give off a tannic acid, and that's basically the same type of stuff that's in tea. And with the large quantities of leaves that are going into this food chain, we create a mangrove tea. Well, we're starting to get questions in from our classroom, from classrooms that are watching us. So here's our first question. Okay, this question's from Independent School in Tampa, and it's how do mangroves help protect the shoreline? <clears throat> well, that, you know, one of the reasons that Florida government, both the state and, and a lot of the counties have passed mangrove protection laws is they do so much work for us. You know, when hurricanes come in, uh, the mangroves, if you look back through the mangroves, you try running through them, you just can't get through them. They, they slow the man, you know, that surge wave from a hurricane down. And people in Southwest Florida and South Florida be paying thousands and thousands of dollars of additional ta insurance premiums if it wasn't for mangroves that help stop, you know, the waves from coming in in a hurricane. And they also, you know, in addition to providing that food for us, help clean up the water. So they protect the shoreline by, and, and the shoreline animals and plants by cleaning up the water. The, we know now that mangroves and seagrasses do as much work as all the sewer plants cost in Southwest Florida. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in building sewer plants and operating them every year. If we didn't have mangroves and seagrasses, we'd have to do their work and they're doing it for us. So they also, you know, help build land by catching silt, you know, the sand and the, and the muck that comes down the, the estuaries. Those red mangrove roots trap it so they help to build land. That's why sometimes they're called the walking tree because they walk out over the oyster bars, you know, with their prop roots and they kind of build land. So they protect us from storms, they protect us from, from, from pollutants, and they help protect us uh, and, and, and enable all the other critters to live, a, live a, a life. Okay, we have another question from Mesa Elementary, and it was, how has pollution affected seagrass? Um, one of the things what you get with pollution is an excessive growth of what we call epiphytes and that's plants that grow on plants. So when you see a lot of pollution out there, what happens is the seagrass blades 
get covered with these other plants that aren't necessarily supposed to be there, and they block out the sunlight from getting to the seagrass itself. And then the seagrass doesn't grow nearly as fast as it's supposed to, so it hurts it that way. We have time for one more question. This, this question is from Western Reserve Middle School in Collins, Ohio. And the question is, how big do mangrove trees get and how fast do they grow? Are these trees endangered? Well, they're not really endangered. They get stressed. You know, and the biggest thing that, that's done most of them in uh, is, is development, you know, where they've been removed. And that's why Florida protected those trees. Uh, they do get hit by pollution and they do get stressed by boat wakes, you know, where the, the boat wake hits the prop roots and makes them weaker and then little gribbles and things get in and can nibble on them. So uh, those, are, uh, those are some of the reasons, but they're not really an endangered plant in, in, in Florida, but they're so special we protect them by law. And on top of that, we know there's vast areas of mangroves. And why protect this huge area of mangroves? Because something bad can happen, and these are hurricanes. Okay, a hurricane can knock down a huge area of force and can take it a very long time to come back, okay? And so that's why we're protecting huge areas. So in case a big storm comes, we lose a lot of mangroves. There's other mangroves around that'll still help with all these things that we know now that mangrove forests can do. See it. it it's, uh, back in the 1960s, an economist, John McQuig, did a study and he found that mangroves and seagrasses in South Florida were worth about $34,000 an acre to the economy of Florida. 30, now, per year, that's per year, every year, it does that work for us. So when we look at the value of these forests, they're great to protect. Now sea level rising is gonna change mangrove forests. When we put too much fresh water into the mangrove forest, that can, that can uh, have a negative effect on them. So there's a lot of things we have to pay attention to as citizens about keeping mangroves forests healthy, but it's mostly pollutants, fresh water, and how we manage those things. And that'll keep the, the mangrove forests healthy. Hey, we didn't tell them how fast they grow. And one of the things about them, they grow like crazy. They're constantly making all these leaves and dropping these leaves into water. Just amazing amounts and very fast. So the answer to that is they grow pretty quick. Over 90 feet. They were down the Everglades before Hurricane Donna, you know, knocked them off. So uh, mangroves get hit by chaos events, and those are hurricanes. So uh, that's what prunes the mangroves off. Well, we do have time for one more question. Right. It says, how can mangroves survive in salt water? Dr. Finn gave you some hints there, you know. Uh, what did he say the black mangroves do? They um, have fingers that come out, so it doesn't work. To come in. In the deep roots. In the deep roots now, to go through. Deep, right? right, those fingers let them breathe where the, where the muck gets so full of sulfur and salts, right? And some of them, the, remember the black mangrove gets salt through the leaf? right, to get rid of it that way. That's one of the special things about mangroves. They're trees that grew up on land and then had to figure out how to live in salt water. So they all had to figure out a way of doing that. Remember the white mangrove? There's two little bumps on the, on the stem and those are little salt glands, you know, for getting rid of salt. So mangrove trees have, have red mangroves are really super at not letting salt in their roots, right? So they keep it out just like your kidneys, get rid of salt for your body. The red mangroves do that. So mangrove trees are are trees that have learned to live in salt water in the brackish water of the estuaries. And that's what makes them so special. Well, I certainly learned a lot during that session. And I wanted to thank Dr. Matt Finn, Dr. Bill Hammond, and this, the cast from the WGCU Curious Kids Club, Devante, Albany, Will, and Amanda. So now we're gonna challenge Carol again. As we move to our third location, Carol will tell another story as she's walking backwards. <laughs> This story is from the African-American tradition. It was recorded by Zora Neale Hurston in her very wonderful collection, Mules and Men. It's the story of why the porpoise has its tail on crosswise and not upright like other fish. When God first created the world, he made the land and the water, and he made all the creatures. He made the porpoise with its tail upright and not crosswise as it is today. It's okay. <laughs> God also made the sky. He made the stars, the moon, and the sun. And when, he got, and when he got finished, he made a gold track around the world, and he greased it. And he called to the sun, and he said, Son, I have made everything there is, and now I want you to make time. I will mark the coming and going 
of you by calling it day and night. The porpoise was sitting right there and he heard everything. He wanted to go on this trip too. So he and the sun started out at exactly the same time. And would you believe it? The porpoise beat him by an hour and three minutes. God said, this is not right. The sun should be the fastest one in all of creation. And so he chased after that porpoise. It took him three days to catch that porpoise because his tail was on upright and not crosswise like it is today. And when God finally caught up with that porpoise, he snatched off his tail, which was upright, and he pushed it back on so that it was crosswise as it is today. He said, Porpoise, this will slow you down. And from now on, the sun will be the fast one, but you will be next in line. Thank you so much, Carol. Well, as we finish our move over to our third location, I wanted to thank some of the people who've helped us today. You've seen lots of people on camera, and you'll see a few more, but there's been lots of other folks who've helped us off campus, probably just as many off campus. We've got the three or four national estuary programs for Florida. We've got Rookery Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve. <laughs> And I'm not quite as talented at walking backwards as Carol is. We've also got the city of Punta Gorda, who is very gracious in, in letting us use their park. We've got the Cargill Crop Nutrition, who's helping us with a lot of the technology. And I'll add a few more people at the end. Our third session focuses on the animals in the estuaries. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our experts. Cesar Rod Rodriguez from Sarasota County. Hi, nice meeting you. Jim Beaver from Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Good morning. And I'll, I'll let the students introduce themselves. My name is Dana Devane. I'm from the Summer Marine Science of 2003 from Hardy Senior High. Whitney from Hardy Senior High. Lacey from Hardy Senior High. Amy from Hardy Senior High. Miranda from Hardy Senior High. Okay, thank you. Who has the first question? Um, I was wondering, how do all these animals um, relate in the estuary? Okay, that's a pretty good question. Uh, we have a lot of interactions in the estuary, and we can take it as a, in the regular food chain. Uh, we start normally with our herbivores, and probably if, if we can see uh, the first the first species, which is uh, the Florida fighting conch, which are herbivores. These guys graze on uh, the thalassia beds and the seagrass bed. Those, those guys are the first, they're the equivalent to the cows <laughs> that we have out on the field. Uh, after that, we have filter feeders, uh, which are, for example, the quahog clam. We have one here, and uh, what they do is they pretty much filter whatever is on the water column, and they, they get the nutrients out of there. Uh, also to that particular group is, uh, are the oysters, uh, which we have next to the horseshoe crabs, and uh, after that, we have the big carnivores. We can start with uh, some, of, some of them, like, for example, the crown conch, um, which is right here. Uh, and there are two or three other specimens around. These guys are the, the big dogs of the, of the show. They like to eat meat, and uh, they're on top of the food chain. Can we see the crown conch? Sure. Uh, with the, uh, do you, um, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a crown conch. Uh, we can see the dorsal part of it. And uh, these guys eat uh, bivalves uh, and they eat uh, any other type of invertebrates that you might find at the bottom of, of, of the estuary. Uh, the, other, the other group that is also very important, uh, and they're also carnivores, is are the, the, um, horse, the, the horse conchs, which are the biggest uh, gastropod that you will find on the estuary. Um, if you can show that, please. Thank you. Uh, those guys eat pretty much anything. They're the equivalent to the lions down on the on the estuary, and uh, they're very very aggressive, and they eat pretty much anything that it's on its path. Other type of the, of animals that we have around the area are uh, the horseshoe crabs that we have here. Um, Did you show us? We have the horseshoe crabs. Uh, we have other type of, of animals like regular crabs, uh, like you will see down on that particular corner. And uh, so it pretty much works from the bottom up, from the primary producers to the, to the predators. Do the horseshoe crabs sting? 
No, actually they uh, uh, actually no, they they don't sting. Uh, that particular tail is for them to be able to flip over. Um, <clears throat> they're important species uh, used for for uh, biomedical research and uh, to detect detection of meningitis. Uh, this is a very e important animal. Uh, it's, it's unique and uh, it's not it's more related to the to the spiders than everybody would think that they're related more to the crustaceans, but they're more related to spiders. They do not have um, they do not have mouth parts like the the crustaceans do, and uh, they also don't have antennas. Uh, what they do have is a modified is a modified uh, um, pincer system, which relates them more to uh, our, uh, the sp the spiders. Are are any of these um, animals used in the aquaculture? Yes. Uh, we have a couple species here that I use for aquaculture. The first one is the quahog clam. Uh, we have a very heavy industry in the state of Florida. It has increased during the last five or six years, especially since 1995, 1996. And uh, they have the, pretty much the yield is about $18.5 million a year on, on um, sales for, uh, for mercenaria. Uh, the other thing that, that, curious enough, they have sold, just in 2001, they sold over 430 million clams for human consumption. Do we have another question? I do. Okay. Um, are these animals affected with the red tide? Well, yes. It's kind of a funny question. Yes and no. Uh, the, in the case of the filter feeders, such as a such as the clams and the oysters, they're not affected by red tide. They tend to accumulate the toxin uh, and they, they don't die. Uh, how the rest of the animals and the estuary can be affected is by depletion of oxygen in the water. When, when you have a red tide event, there is a massive die-off of fish and that tends to deplete the oxygen out of the water column. Uh, this will cause that the rest of the animals that live at the bottom of the estuary will lack oxygen and a lot of them will die. Well, at this time, we'd like to turn to Jim. Jim, did you want to talk or were there questions? There's a question about um, whether the red tide affects animals like um, manatees and dolphins. And in fact, it does. The dolphins which feed upon fish can feed upon fish which have been concentrated with the red tide and there'll be toxicity associated with that. Manatees, which are a herbivore, again, a cow of the estuary, although much more the size of a cow, related to the elephant, will feed upon seagrasses and red tide organisms associated with that seagrasses and breathing the air where the red tide organism is located can lead to toxicity in manatees and death. And in fact, red tide deaths are the second most uh, documented cause of manatee death in Southwest Florida. Um, after the mechanical damage which can come from boat collisions and being caught in locks. We had a couple manatees that were out here in the channel here earlier before um, we got started with our telecast and they were moving up the channel during the incoming tide. Last winter we went swimming with the manatees in Homosassa Springs and there were a lot of people swimming there. Is there any pros and cons to this? Yes, there are. Um, the pros of swimming with manatees is it's an opportunity for people and the manatee to interact so we can have a better appreciation of the environment in which they exist. And as we learn about manatees, we get an appreciation for their lifestyles, what they depend upon. And I think people will be more careful about manatees when they have that opportunity. The con side is that you don't always want to be swimming with manatees. They need an opportunity to complete their life cycle. There are places where they need to be when they give birth, not to be disturbed by human beings. And in general, people should only swim with manatees under carefully control controlled conditions, and the special places have been set aside for that. How do our uplands affect our estuaries? Um, well, basically, the upland system is the watershed basin of the whole total estuary. And we have a wide biodiversity of animals and plants which occur in that estuary. Over here at this poster, which is one of the main um, posters for the estuary program, we can see the relationship from the harbor all the way up to the highest, driest uplands. And many animals which are found in those areas are um, related and linked to the estuary. 
um, we're going to pick out a gopher tortoise here and, and bring him over. And that gopher tortoise, even though it's way up in the highest and driest parts of the estuary, has links to that estuary. This is a keystone species, and the, the species is digs a burrow, which can be the home not just for the gopher tortoise, but to over 111 other species which are found there. And the gopher tortoise's feeding adjusts the plants that are found there, and when the raindrop falls upon the estuary, it will circulate down through the estuary to this area and be cleansed for water quality. Boat question. Okay, how do the boats that are in this canal affect our estuary? Well, the estuary has been highly modified for large vessels like this. The original estuary system was very shallow and was suitable for the vessels like the kayaks that we have seen uh, going by here. And this was the actual type of boat that, say, and the size and draft that the Indians, the Calusa Indians, used to use here. Um, the vessel we saw just passed, they had to highly modify the estuary, dredge this deep channel, make modifications through the seagrass beds, cut through oyster bars so that we could get through the shallows to the deeper water. This high modification with the dredge and fill which modified and removed mangroves to make uplands has been one of the major habitat impacts to the Charlotte Harbor estuary. Okay, down this canal there are a bunch of housing developments and stuff. What is the effect on Charlotte Harbor? The housing developments on Charlotte Harbor had multiple manifold effects on the harbor. They have um, reduced the amount of habitat available for that connection between the upland and the wetland systems of the estuary. The chemicals which are put upon the landscape, uh, pesticides, nutrients, herbicides, all sorts of variety of different materials get into the water and change and lower the water quality of the harbor. And in order for these people to live in an upland which was formerly a wetland area, there have been major changes to the hydrology to prevent flooding. And so as a result, all three eight major areas of impact to the harbor have occurred because people want to be close to it on these canal systems. Thank you. That's all that I have. Well, I see that we've gotten lots of questions from the Internet, so thank you all. Who's the first person to read a question? Would you come over here, please? Vermilion High School in Louisiana asks, how do you tell the difference between a male and female crab? Okay, if we can bring. I would like to show something here. Uh, there's a blue crab, and we can get it out of the water. This one unfortunately doesn't have the claws on it, but you can tell because in the case of the males, you see this structure here that covers pretty much the gills. Uh, this structure in the case of the males is elongated looks like a tower. In the case of the females, it looks like a half a moon. They're very easily distinguishable and you can apply that to all the crabs that are around. We can tell that, for example, there's another one, there's another crab here and as you can tell from here, this one is a male. Another question? Um, this is from Mr. Baker's fifth period science class in Central Middle School. Um, do we have sharks in Charlotte Harbor? We'd like to answer that question. <laughs> yes, we have all kinds of different sharks in Charlotte Harbor, and Charlotte Harbor is actually an important breeding ground for many shark species. In the creek back here that we're in, you can find bull shark, you can find black tip shark. Out in the deeper harbor, there are some uh, great hammerheads, uh, makos, and even occasionally in the very coldest of weather, a great white will occasionally show up at the pass. Do we have another question? Yes, this is from Ms. Wicker's class in East Lee Middle School. How many fish species are in the estuary? Tim? How many fish species are in the estuary? 384. <laughs> um, we've counted them as part of re research um, surveys, and we found them in all sorts of different ways with large nets, which are part of a special program done by Florida Marine Research Institute. Um, down to going and swimming underneath these mangrove prop roots and slurping them out with a slurp gun. And we found fishes um, like the clownfish from the movie Finding Nemo. In Miss Holland's class, Cedar Hill Schools, how deep in the water do blue crabs live? Well, they can live anywhere uh, on uh, very shallow waters, from anywhere from one foot to about, I'll say about 15 feet. That's where the crabs, uh, the crab trappers uh, put their, their, their traps for the commercial harvesting of these species. In Ms. Hyde's research class, Seabrook Interme Intermediate School, what are some migrant, migratory birds that visit your estuaries? 
Some of the uh, migratory birds that visit our estuary include the white pelican. The bald eagle is actually migratory here, coming down from up north to nest on the uh, pine trees and feed in the harbor. We have a wide variety of tanagers, vireos, sparrows, orioles. All these move through this area and we'll use the coastal habitats as they migrate through in the spring and autumn. Hey, this is from Mrs. Sabatini's class in Carroll Elementary. What predators live in an estuary? There are a wide variety of predators in the estuary. In fact, most of the animals that are here are predatory in one form or other. Of course, we have the sharks, we have the bottlenose dolphins, we have a variety of uh, octopus, although our octopus tend to be medium to small size. We have eels, most of the bony fishes are a predator of one form or other. Um, the sea trout, the redfish, and the snook. Uh, occasionally, coming down into the mangrove areas, you'll have um, upland predators as large as the Florida black bear. How can we protect the manatees? Okay, the best way to protect the manatees is to make sure that they have the habitats they need to complete their life cycle. So we need to protect the harbor, the seagrass beds that they feed upon, the special areas where they go to have their babies, and the upper river systems because manatees are found not just in the lower harbor but all the way up the rivers, all the way up the Peace River, the Mayaka River, and we need to maintain those habitat zones. We also need to pay attention and honor the speed zones which are set aside so that the safe waters for the manatees to swim through and not be struck by boat impacts. You guys have a lot of great questions that you're asking. We're going to um, read a few more that are, that are specific to animals and then we're going to open it up to all of our experts. So if our experts would be ready to answer some of the que other questions that come in, I'd appreciate it. This is from Dr. Phillips High School in Orlando, Florida. What fish species in Charlotte Harbor are popular for recreational fishing? Okay, some of the most popular recreational fish species and the ones that people spend a lot of time going after are redfish and snook. We also have a very big tarpon tournament, and this is one of the largest tarpon tournaments in the world out at Boca Grand Pass, and they really spend a lot of time and a lot of trouble to catch a few really big fish. And we do a lot of other types of fishing uh, associated with the harbor, often for flounder, pompano when they're running. It's a great fishing spot. In fact, it's one of the reasons I ended up down here because my dad wanted to go fishing here. <laughs> do we have one more question? What can we do to help improve our estuary system? Who would like to answer that question? Well, I'll take it. Um, I think the first thing is to uh, stay in contact with it. Uh, you have to experience the estuary to really appreciate it. And that it can include uh, learning about it, it can include boating, diving, fishing, admiring sunsets. Uh, anything we can do to interact with an estuary makes it real for us. The second thing, if you remember at the beginning of the show, I suggested that uh, studying science and especially estuarine ecology is a good career choice for many of you. And um, just staying uh, uh, an advocate for the estuary in, in every aspect of life it, it will help it in the long run. Do we have another question? How much of the economy is based on the estuary? Who would like to answer that question? Uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, species that come from here are being used for human consumption. Uh, we have the we have the coho clam. We have also the crab industry. We have also the stone crab industry, and they generate they have generated over 19 million dollars. And this is just for the state of Florida on the estuaries, a total $19 million on products that have been sold to the public for, for consumption. Would anybody else like to add to that? I'd like to mention that not just the things that we extract from the estuary, but the whole economy of this area depends upon Charlotte Harbor. People are coming here because of the beauty of this harbor. The boats that we see passing here, the development, the whole economy depends back upon that harbor. It's literally billions of dollars which are generated by the benefits and attributes provided by Charlotte Harbor. Renee, do you have a question? Actually, I was going to add to the answer, which means that because so much of the Florida economy depends on estuaries for recreation and commercial harvest, it's very important that these estuaries are protected so they remain healthy for future enjoyment and future harvests for years to come. 
Great. Would anybody else like to add? Well, you know, I think uh, we all look at the estuaries. It's the, it's the economy fueler for southwest Florida. You know, it's the reason people come here. But the part we often forget are the benefits that come from the fact the estuary is here and is healthy. Uh, storm surge protection uh, can be worth literally hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And certainly to the, to the rate payers in flood insurance in southwest Florida, it keeps people from having to pay much higher insurance premiums for flood insurance. So that's a big, that's a big asset. Pollution control. Uh, the estuaries right now are probably taking up the 10% of the sewage processing that we tend not to process. So seagrasses and mangroves are absorbing an awful lot of that pollutant load. Uh, we know that it costs as much to get rid of the to get rid of the 99 percent of the sewage. The last one percent costs as much as that. So if we just say uh, the mangroves are picking up five percent of it, that's the equivalent of the cost of all our sewer plants built in Southwest Florida, and all of their annual operating costs. We're talking about hundred million dollar kind of numbers when we look at those aspects. So we all think of fisheries and beauty and and and, and you know a sense of place that you get in an estuary. But it's got all these other dimensions to it that we tend, in the old way of thinking about economics, not to account for. And now we're getting smarter about accounting for the real values of, of, of these uh, ecological systems. Thank you. And Xander's got a question for us. Is there any frozen asteroids around the poles? <laughs> he likes those trick questions. <laughs> Yes, there are. Um, and these estuaries, which are the mix of the fresh and the salt water, will be frozen for that period when that pole is on its winter season and then thaw out for a very short time and are very, very active and very productive during the sh very short summer. Okay. You've got a question from Michael. Um, does the glaciers affect the estuaries in Alaska? You yes, guys. yes, they are. Uh, yes, they do. The glaciers do affect the estuaries in Alaska. They are the source often of the fresh water. And we just recently um, visited one in the Nisqually River in the, the Puget Sound area where the fresh water principally came from the glacier. Well, I'd like to thank all of our experts and all of our students. They've all done a wonderful job. And thank you for visiting with us. While we uh, leave the program, we'd like to um, show you a little bit more of our estuary so that we could focus on that. It's a beautiful place. We encourage you all to come visit.